Will Jared Isaacman fly to Hubble as NASA Administrator? Why was 2i Borisov covered much less than Oumuamua and 3i Atlas? Does the Milky Way have galactic weather? And in Q&A Plus, my thoughts about the SpaceX IPO. All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Gadzooks, should NASA allow Jared Isaacman to head a mission to fix Hubble? So Jared Eisenman, who was a or is a private astronaut, has led several private missions on SpaceX Crew Dragons to go to space, and was originally proposed to be the new NASA administrator. Trump had had nominated him, I'm assuming on Elon Musk's recommendation. And then they went with Sean Duffy, who's already the uh, the transportation minister. And Sean Duffy is busy. And so like NASA is just getting short shrift. And so now it looks like they've put Jared Isaacman's name back into it. And so he will most likely become the new NASA administrator. But before, under his Polaris mission company, he had proposed that they could do a mission to fix Hubble and boost its orbit again. And of course, the problem with Hubble is it's a machine that's breaking down. And it is a machine that is orbiting the Earth and it is low, it's on a low Earth orbit. And every orbit, it loses a little bit of altitude every year. And eventually, it's going to get so low that it's going to re enter the Earth's atmosphere. Now, they have a way of deorbiting Hubble safely, but it is an oversubscribed mission. It would totally suck to lose that telescope. So, why not boost it? And so this was the idea. This was the proposal that they take a crew dragon, they put the spare parts that Hubble needs, they train the astronauts to be able to do a mission to repair Hubble and go through this process. And NASA had had said originally, thank you for your suggestion, we will take it under advisement. And that was the last we heard of it, that at no point did we get the impression that NASA was taking this idea seriously. But now the administrator of NASA is the person who is proposing the idea. So that seems like it's a, a sure thing. And then at the same time, he's put together a plan for what he thinks the future of NASA should be. I know there's like a lot of sort of intention and Trump wants to see boots on the moon, wants to see missions to Mars, wants to see a lot of very exciting things happening from NASA. And so I think those will dovetail together. And at the same time, though, there's a lot of momentum, there's a lot of missions that are in the works. You've got the Titan Dragonfly, you've got the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, you've got uh, potentially a Mars sample return mission. You've got, of course, what's going on with the Artemis program. Does that get redone, revised? So there's a lot of irons in the fire. There's the International Space Station. What happens to that? What about the Lunar Gateway? So we haven't got a plan yet. But it would not surprise me if one of the proposed missions is to send up a crew dragon and repair the Hubble Space Telescope and boost its orbit and give it another 20 years of operation. That would be great. I would love that. I like I think it's a great idea. Mimi virus 173. Why wasn't two I Borisov covered as extensively as Omomo or Atlas? Am I living under a rock? Or was Borisov just not in the media as much? Good question. Right? We had Omuamua. It was weird, you know, funny shape, and it was detected on its way out. We had Borisov, which really behaved precisely like a comet in all ways, and was also detected on the way out. You know, the big advantage with 3i Atlas is that it was detected on the way in. We have more advanced warning, more time to study it. It was also very interesting because it was coming in pretty close to the plane of the ecliptic. Which is not surprising because the plane of the ecliptic is where astronomers search for asteroids, right? All of the detection tools are oriented to look in the place where all of the asteroids and comets are likely to be, which is the plane of the ecliptic. I even know if the Atlas telescope can find stuff that's outside of the plane of the ecliptic. Just makes you wonder how many interstellar objects which are perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic or passing through and we we just didn't even notice them. So why is this one bigger? And I would say it's the advance notice 
And I think that there is this kind of just growing appreciation for interstellar objects in general, right? Oumuamua was like, there it goes, right? And so we only got a little bit of time to sort of study it and it was gone. And same thing with Borisov. But with Atlas, you know, there's all this anticipation. It's coming into the solar system. We saw it out by the orbit of Jupiter, and it's making its way past Mars, past the Sun, past the Earth, past Jupiter again. All these spacecraft are well positioned to be able to observe it. And so I think a lot of the excitement for Atlas is just the anticipation of what we're going to be able to discover when we turn all of these telescopes on it. With the other two, it was too late. And so we couldn't build that anticipation. And so it's sort of like you're looking forward to what might happen. Amelia Nolanari. Do you know if the Milky Way has some kind of weather like the sun has? Sort of, but not in the same way that the sun has it. So the sun, right, is this massive incandescent gas. And it has solar flares, coronal mass ejections, various events that are going on the surface. But the Milky Way is the combined illumination from 100 billion stars. And so there are no singular events, you know, you're not going to get a flare from the Milky Way, because the Milky Way is, is 100 billion stars separated by light years apart, they all are leading their own separate lives. But there is an equivalent of like the sun has the solar wind, that there is this constant stream of particles that is coming from the sun. And that the sun is creating this bubble around itself in the Milky Way, which is all of the solar wind that is coming off of it. But the Milky Way is made up of the combined solar winds of all of that 100 plus billion stars. And so that is called like the interstellar wind, the interstellar medium, and that there is this boundary between the wind that is coming off of the sun, and the combined shared wind from all of those stars, the Voyager spacecraft, they passed through it and were able to feel sense the magnetic field lines, but they were able to detect the presence of, you know, right now we're in the sun's solar wind, and now we're in the interstellar wind, which is really cool. The other kind of weather that you can get can happen when a galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the heart of it. And so when it has a supermassive black hole, you know, something with millions or maybe even billions of times the mass of the sun, it can go through periods where it's actively feeding when it's actually like consuming material, and then times when it's quiet. And the times when it's quiet, it's just this giant rotating invisible sphere, right? Because you know, it absorbs all the light, you can't see it. But then there are times when it is feeding when stars get too close when material falls into it, and it builds up this big accretion disk around the black hole. And then this accretion as the black hole is spinning inside the accretion disk, these magnetic fields sort of swirl around the accretion disk, and you get these jets of material that can come off of the supermassive black hole. And we see that as a quasar, like when we look at out into the cosmos, we see these point sources that are incredibly bright. And it turns out, these are supermassive black holes that are emanating jets in our general direction, and we can see them. And so it's starting to look like the the transition, the switch between the black holes actively feeding and throwing off tons of radiation, and then not feeding and has settled down and is quiescent can be very quick, like it might be that it just turns on over the course of like days or weeks, years, but but not millennia, like it's a quick, it's a quick process to go from, oh, the black hole is, is active again. Um, and just in the last couple of weeks, astronomers detected a flare that was very similar to a solar flare coming out of the accretion disk of a supermassive black hole that was like 100 million light years away. You know, they're not entirely sure what happened, but sort of imagine you got this supermassive black hole, it's got this accretion disk swirling around it. And then off on one side of it, this big flare came out and it was moving at like 20% the speed of light. And it looks like maybe a star passed into or joined this accretion disk and was torn apart. Or maybe something like another black hole plunged right through the accretion disk and caused this flare. And so like, that's the closest that you would get to something which is like this moment of activity the way the sun gets. So the whole galaxy doesn't have solar storms in the way it has the combined 
combined solar storms of all of the stars. It's this average across all of them. It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above. Rick McCroskey, Patrick Filth, Judd M, Austin, Craig Ewing, Raymond Ty, Richard M. Glenn, Unknown Caller, Ray Grunberg, and Tim Crockett. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Luca Lunardi. First time catching you live. I like that you make everything free on Patreon, but I have YouTube premium. I watch almost all your videos in full. Is premium worth it as it's support for creators? Like everything is, is amazing support, right? Even if you watch your stuff, you didn't pay us at all, and you just enjoyed it, then that would be worth it to me. Um, I might have trouble paying the bills, but there's still value there. You know, that, that a person is spending time and learning about space and is going to go on to share that enthusiasm with the rest of the world, which you will, right? But, you know, we as creators, we get paid by YouTube. So we get paid for the people who are, who are just like watching it with ads. Uh, you know, YouTube forces us to put ads at the beginning of every video. They really want us to put ads in the middle of our videos and the end of our videos, but we turn them, we politely decline. So we just do the, the ads at the beginning of the video. And then they also give you a cut for the amount of time that people spend who are premium members. And I don't know sort of like what the revenue rate is, but it's pretty good. Like it is better for a premium member to watch your videos than the amount of money that you make from advertisers. So it is definitely better. Uh, you know, how you consume our material is up to you. Like, I still think that Patreon is a, is a better experience. Um, you know, you are still beholden to the YouTube algorithm to decide whether or not you're going to watch our videos anymore. Now, if you're, you know, one of the the power users, uh, you ha have subscribed to our channel, and then you only watch videos from the subscriptions tab, and then you will watch our new videos whenever they come out. You will get notifications on when we're going to be doing our live streams, um, and so on. But YouTube is a fickle mistress. And we've experienced many times in the past where YouTube is really into what you're doing and they want to share you out to as many people as possible. And then there's times when YouTube is not interested and they're a lot more interested in shorts or live streams or longer stuff or shorter stuff or music or podcasts. Or I don't know. Right now it's AI. <laughs> you know, AI slop to fall asleep to. And so they will give emphasis to that kind of thing or, you know, completely made up hysterical clickbait slop designed to destroy all objective reality. That's something they're really into right now. So we have no connection right now. If you just like watch your stuff on YouTube, you're like, yeah, I really like Fraser's stuff. That's great. And then, and then YouTube just sort of like quietly shuts the door between us and you never notice. You're like, whatever happened to Fraser? Did he just give up? Nope. Was still producing content, but now he's just no longer there. So that's why you want a direct connection. You want to sign up to my weekly email newsletter. You want to, if you join us on Patreon and then for free, right? Like don't pay anything. And then you will get a notification. You get an email every time we release a new video. And so if it's important to you, like if it's, if it's that important to you that you enjoy our stuff, then if YouTube stopped telling you that it was happening, would that make you sad? And if it would make you sad, then just connect, right? And call your parents. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, what do I think about the SpaceX IPO? And this is not investment advice. I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are the questions that we had this episode. We are back from the one month uh, live stream hiatus. And so these questions are fresh hot off the brains of the people who watch the live shows as well as people who put their comments into the YouTube comments. So I'm going to chat about sort of what's going to happen over the holidays. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Barely Grooving, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bielok, Cy Nelson, Dark Finger, David Gilton, and David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Nord Space, One Step for Animals.org, Paul Robach, Rink Heidi, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Team Feller Munley, Team 49, Telescopes Canada, Wolfgang Klotz, and Zelda Board Galactic Defender, who support us at the Master of the Universe level and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So it's time to figure out what's going to happen for the holidays. And normally, you know, we take a bunch of breaks because often the Christmas and New Year's show up very 
close to when we're doing live streams. But in this case, it's sort of like they're exactly exactly opposite. So uh, Christmas is like midweek, but my shows are on the beginning of the week. And so there's going to be no disruption at all. Um, I did a show on Monday, the 22nd, I'm going to do a show on Monday at my normal time, 5pm Pacific. And then I'm going to do a show a week after that. So it's just week after week after week, all of the live streams. We are planning an end of the year special, but it's going to be kind of weird, uh, which is that we are going to look back at 2015 as what uh, we consider to be the greatest year in modern astronomy and sort of all of the interesting things that happened during that year and sort of what we've learned since then. So it's a bit of an unusual year end wrap up a different year. Uh, but hey, from everyone here on the team, everybody who uh, sort of works with Universe Today, as well as the producers, Chad, video editor, uh, Anton, the other video editor, uh, we would like all to wish all of you a great holiday. And you know, I hope you have fun and good times with your friends and your family. And you watch a lot of sci fi and you catch up on all of those video games that you were hoping to get through, read a couple of books. And of course, watch some of our shows. All right, we'll see you next time.